Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is acute inflammation. So this uh, covers uh, some of the material in Chapter 2 of uh, Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology uh, and is part of the general pathology foundational material in the textbooks. And the goal here is to provide an understanding for the material that you will see again and again in the different organ systems. So with that in mind, I'm going to begin by describing the key features of acute inflammation, discussing the steps and processes of phagocytosis, and then compare and contrast the possible outcomes of acute inflammation. So when you mention the term acute inflammation, you probably think immediately about infectious causes, so bacteria, viruses, fungi, etc. But there are a lot of other causes of acute inflammation, so tissue necrosis and injury, uh, for example, from infarction or trauma or toxins. Uh, allergens can cause acute inflammation, and foreign bodies, such as silica in the lungs or uric acid in gout. Now, acute inflammation has some uh, characteristic components. So one of them will be the dilation of small blood vessels, which is going to increase blood flow, causing erythema and warmth in the area of inflammation. The next uh, characteristic will be increased permeability of the microvasculature. So this is going to allow plasma, proteins, and leukocytes to exit uh, the vasculature to address the acute inflammation. And then there are leukocytes. And in Robbins, we have uh, just one sentence about what leukocytes do. I've expanded that. These are all the things that leukocytes need to do in the context of acute inflammation. They have to leave the microcirculation, accumulate at the site of injury, and then they have to activate and eliminate the target. So here are the, uh, the three uh, steps or the three characteristics of acute inflammation, dilation of small blood vessels, increased permeability, and emigration of leukocytes. And I'm going to show this in the uh, context of a really nice figure from Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology 11th edition. Beginning first, let's take a look at the healthy vasculature. So we have our arterial, uh, our capillary bed, and our post-capillary venule. In the context of acute inflammation due to tissue necrosis or bacterial infection, we're going to get elaboration of mediators. These mediators are going to cause vasodilation, which you can see here. This ves these vessels are larger in diameter than these are here. We're going to get increased vascular permeability. If you look, you can see there's a little bit more space here between our endothelial cells. This is going to allow fluid to leave, leading to this light blue circle here, which is edema, as well as neutrophils. So these are our characteristics just shown here uh, in this image. So let's focus now on the blood vessel reactions in acute inflammation. So as I mentioned, there's some sort of mediators. The classic one will be histamine, which leads to vasodilation, increasing blood flow, warmth, and erythema. But at the same time, we're going to get increased permeability of our microvasculature to allow plasma proteins and leukocytes to move. And this occurs primarily through contraction of endothelial cells. Now, this is a short-lived phenomenon, 15 to 30 minutes. But don't just think that you know, if you have that injury, that there's 15 to 30 minutes of edema and then it shuts down. Because injury isn't cleared in 15 to 30 minutes. There's ongoing injury uh, that's occurring. Some of that injury is from the inflammation itself. So that's why when you injure yourself, you may notice you have edema for quite a long period. A secondary uh, way that we can get increased permeability will be through endothelial injury, so direct injury, which is what we see in burns. Uh, but the contraction of endothelial cells is the uh, primary contributor here. Now, we talk here about how we have vasodilation increase in our blood flow, warmth, and erythema, but at the same time, that dilation is going to increase uh, the area of that uh, vessel, which is going to slow flow, and we're also going to be losing fluid through our increased permeability, this is now going to cause decreased blood flow, and that's going to be important for our neutrophils to get where they need to go. But let's take a moment, first of all, to talk about this uh, permeability of the microvasculature and what happens. So when we get this increased vascular permeability, we're going to get what's called an exudate in which we have a high protein content and a few scattered white and red cells. So this is uh, what we see in inflammation. We have increased interendothelial spaces, which I think is showed a little bit more nicely here in this 10th uh, edition image where you can see the space more clearly, as well as this neutrophil moving out of the vessel. Uh, this uh, vasodilation and stasis is what slows us down, and we have our fluid and protein leakage. Now, I'm going to digress for a moment, take a little detour, just to talk about 
exudates and transudates, because now it's just a good opportunity because we're talking about fluid. Now remember that in the healthy individual, our hydrostatic pressure and our colloid osmotic pressure are going to balance, so we will have no net fluid or protein leakage. In our exudate, because we have this increased space and we have slowing and stasis, we're going to get fluid and protein leakage. And we can also get something called a transudate, which in contrast to an exudate has low protein content and even fewer cells. So we see this in uh, two contexts. One is with increased hydrostatic pressure. The other is with decreased colloid osmotic pressure. So increased hydrostatic pressure, which we can see, for example, a venous outflow obstruction in, for example, congestive heart failure, is going to cause more pressure pushing fluid out, leading to edema. Decreased colloid osmotic pressure is going to happen when we have decreased protein synthesis, for example, in liver disease, increased protein loss uh, when we have kidney disease, or when you have protein malnutrition. And there is no longer going to be all this protein in here that's pulling water in, therefore water will leave. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. Now let's talk about what the leukocytes do, because this is a very uh, complicated uh, ballet, and it warrants some time. So the first thing is, is that these leukocytes that are traveling in the blood need to get out of the blood. They need to accumulate at wherever this injury is, and they have to activate to eliminate the agent, and then they have to destroy the agent through phag phagocytosis. So how do we do this? So let's first talk about the first step, emigration from microcirculation. This is going to be mediated by adhesion molecules and cytokines. Now the first thing that needs to happen is that the leukocytes, which are traveling very rapidly in the blood, because they're large cells and blood is moving quickly, they tend to be in that central column uh, of, the, uh, of the vessel. We need them to slow and uh, settle towards the outside of the vessel wall. This is called margination, and it happens when the flow slows due to our vasodilation and loss of fluid. Next, they will begin rolling this loose attachment to endothelial cells due to interactions between selectins and their ligands. The next step is they have to stop rolling and stick. And once they stick to those endothelial cells, that gives them the opportunity to begin transmigration, also known as diapedesis, to go from the vasculature into the um, perivascular soft tissue to thereby migrate towards where the pathogen is. So uh, I'm going to come uh, back to this picture several times. We're not going to cover it all in one step. So here we have our leukocyte in health, which is zipping down the middle of our vascular highway. As we get um, vasodilation and loss of fluid, the flow is going to slow and it's going to settle down here. It's going to marginate, so it's going to be closer to this endothelium. The next step that's going to happen is that it is going to begin to roll. Uh, now, what the leukocytes have is they have a selectin ligand here on their surface, which is going to bind to selectins which are expressed on the endothelial surface. And these selectins are only expressed when they are stimulated and activated by cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor and IL-1 elaborated by our macrophages. So in this setting, the macrophage is saying, hey, you guys need to upregulate these, which then can bind to our selectin ligand and begin this rolling process. So let's take a moment here to look at our selectins. There are uh, three types. Uh, both, one of them is on lymphocytes, two are on endothelium. These are their ligands, uh, and this is what's going to perform that sort of that weak interaction that allows this rolling along the surface. Now, rolling's not good enough. We actually have to really stick on there because that's what it's going to take before we can move out of the vessel. And this is going to be mediated by a different type of protein called an integrin, which is a leukocyte cell surface protein. Now, in an unactivated leukocyte, they're going to be in a low affinity form. So the uh, body does not want them to bind if there's no inflammation. So they're just, just moving along through the vasculature. With chemokine-mediated activation, they're going to shift to a high affinity form, which is going to enable them uh, to bind uh, to the endothelium. And it's going to be cytokines like tumor necrosis factor and IL-1 that are going to, again, increase our endothelial expression of ligands in the right area. Okay, so here we're rolling, and our integrin is in its low affinity state. But what we have here is chemokines that are being elaborated by our macrophage, uh, which are going to bind here on this proteoglycan on this endothelial cell. And when that interacts here with this leukocyte, it's going to shift this integrin to a high affinity state, which is going to enable it to bind here 
to the integrin ligand ICAM1. So now it's stuck. So it's like uh, they refer to this as being like pebbles uh, on um, a riverbed and the, and the blood is flowing over it, but these are stuck. And then we're going to begin our process of moving uh, through uh, the vessel wall. Let's take a moment first, though, to talk about our integrins. So these are the adhesion molecules that are involved, uh, and these are their ligands. And the uh, primary one is going to be ICAM-1, intracellular adhesion molecule 1, uh, as well as uh, vascular cell adhesion molecule, and then we also have mucosal cell adhesion molecule. And these are going to be expressed by uh, our um, our uh, leukocytes, uh, and these uh, are going to be ones that are expressed uh, on um, uh, our other cells, uh, and these are our ligands. This is the actual molecule here. Okay, so now we're stuck. We need to move on through. So this is going to be mediated by platelet endothelial cell adhesion molecule 1, also known as CD31. And this is going to occur through little phylopodia that the cell is going to extend, and it's going to be following a concentration gradient, which is uh, made up of bacterial products, cytokines, chemokines, complement, leukotrienes, and following this is called chemotaxis. So our final image here is going to show the whole story. Leukocyte marginates, rolls, sticks, transmigrates, follows this uh, chemokine cytokine trail, to the microbes. So here we have our neutrophil, here we have our macrophage. Let's talk a little bit about these cells. So acute inflammation uh, follows a time-directed uh, process. Uh, initially, as I mentioned, you're going to have edema, which is slowly going to uh, resolve. We're going to have neutrophils uh, moving in on day one, and then monocytes and macrophages coming uh, with more time. So here we have a myocardial infarction, which is acute. Neutrophils uh, have mobilized immediately to address uh, this necrotic tissue. And over the next few days, macrophages are going to come in. And you can see this is a necrotic cardiac myocyte that is being consumed uh, by macrophages. Let's do a compare and contrast of these two phagocytic cells. Uh, you can see that they have very different lifespans, neutrophils just one to two days before they give up the ghost. Macrophages, days, weeks, tissue macrophages may be there for years. The response to stimuli in neutrophils is rapid, short-lived, and is characterized by degranulation and enzyme uh, digestion. Whereas macrophages, as they're orchestrating a lot of what's going on in the inflammatory response, also are using gene transcription to modulate. So they have a more modulated uh, response to inflammation. Reactive oxygen species are uh, rapidly induced by neutrophils. They have a smaller role in macrophages. Nitric oxide is uh, primarily involved in macrophages, not neutrophils. And degranulation uh, is the major response in neutrophils. Uh, cytokines are really the uh, role of macrophages. As I mentioned, they are orchestrating the immune response. And the secretion of lysosomal enzymes is much more neutrophil uh, activity uh, than macrophage. So let's talk about how phagocytosis occurs, because that's what we need to do. We've gotten our leukocytes to the right area. Now they need to start clearing some debris. So the first thing they need to do is to recognize that particle. So one uh, example would be uh, the mannose receptor, which we can see uh, on uh, bacterial cells. The phagocyte receptor will bind to the particle, and this um, binding is enhanced by opsonins, such as antibodies, C3B complement fragment, plasma lectins. So it's going to bind onto that, and then it's going to engulf it into a phagosome, which will then fuse with a lysosome, yielding the phagolysosome, where digestion occurs. So this is a nice image from Robbins and Kumar, Basic Pathology 11th edition. I'm going to go through this in steps. So here we have uh, our phagocytic cell. We have our receptor, which is going to bind to our microbe, which is going to stimulate the cell to engulf this particle. Uh, and the phagocyte membrane will zip up around the microbe, forming this little bubble uh, that will then travel through the cytoplasm and fuse with a lysosome. This will then lead to uh, degradation of the microbes in, due to the um, lysosomal enzymes. Now there's a little bit more going on here, so I'm going to uh, take a little time to go through each of these. So let's talk about uh, destruction. So how does this happen? In neutrophils, there are uh, reactive oxygen species that are generated through phagocyte oxidase, also known as NADPH oxidase. What this enzyme does is it oxidizes NADPH, pulling off that electron, giving it to O2 to yield superoxide, which then can then 
uh, be transformed to hydrogen peroxide. And how do we know this is a neutrophil? Myeloperoxidase. Myeloperoxidase uh, plus a halide ion such as chloride uh, can yield a hypochlorite, uh, which is the active ingredient in bleach. Not very good for microbes. Uh, H2O2 can also, uh, with um, iron, go through the Fenton reaction to yield uh, the hydroxide ion. Uh, so all of these are good at uh, destruction. In uh, macrophages, we're going to be using reactive nitrogen species, so nitric oxide. Uh, we have here uh, inducible uh, nitric oxide uh, synthesis, or sorry, synthase, which is going to take arginine and convert it to nitric oxide, which is going to join with superoxide from phagocyte oxidase to uh, yield Oh no, or peroxynitrite, which is very good at destroying. So here you can see the whole thing put together. We have our neutrophils, we have our macrophages. Now, this isn't all that we have. We also have our just general lysosomal enzymes. So uh, neutrophils have uh, two types of granules, primary and specific. Uh, primary. We also have lysosomal enzymes. So neutrophils have primary and secondary granules. So azurophil, which includes our uh, canonical myeloperoxidase, uh, and specific, which have lysozymes, collagenases, etc. Macrophages have also a variety of different enzymes uh, in their lysosomes, acid hydrolases, collagenases, etc. So now we've destroyed, right? So we've, we've taken care of what we had. Now what happens? How do we come to an end of acute inflammation? So there are three possibilities. One is complete resolution, and this is what we see when you have a short, minor injury. So perhaps a cut uh, in your skin, uh, minimal tissue destruction, uh, and the epithelial cells are capable of regeneration. So shortly after you have this injury, there will be no evidence whatsoever that anything has happened. We'll have removal of the cellular debris, any microbes there, resorption of edema fluid, everything is good. Another possibility, if the injury is more substantial and we have tissue destruction and the parenchymal cells are incapable of regeneration, will be healing by connective tissue replacement, so scarring or fibrosis. We can also see this if we have exuberant fibrin deposition uh, that cannot be cleared. So for example, we see this in uh, fibrinous inflammation, such as fibrinous pericarditis. And then finally, we can get progression to chronic inflammation. This occurs when we can't resolve our acute inflammatory response. Maybe it's a very challenging bacterium, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, or maybe uh, it's because of some other impaired healing, uh, perhaps an individual with diabetes. So let's look at this figure that goes through these three possibilities. Here we have, again, acute inflammation, moving to resolution, scarring, and chronic inflammation. So let's look first at resolution. Uh, here we have uh, clearance of our injurious st uh, stimuli, clearance of the mediators in acute inflammatory cells, replacement of injured cells, normal function. So it looks just like it did ahead of time. But as I also mentioned, if you have significant damage, we can get loss of function through scarring or fibrosis, where we have abundant collagen and connective tissue that is laid down by fibroblasts. So let's take a look at an example of this. This is uh, an image of a myocardial infarction, which this image right here is going to encapsulate for you what acute inflammation is. What is all of the space? This is all edema. These are all neutrophils and these are necrotic uh, cardiac myocytes. They have this hyper eosinophilia because denatured protein binds very well uh, to eosin. Let's look on a little higher magnification. You can appreciate here, these are acute uh, inflammatory cells. So neutrophils, this is going to be day one to two perhaps. And I just want to highlight for you, when you see a sea of neutrophils, you need to think acute inflammation, right? Whenever you see neutrophils, start thinking acute inflammation. Now you're going to learn in the video on chronic inflammation that you can also see neutrophils in chronic inflammation. But when you see something like this, this is telling you, no questions asked, there's acute inflammation going on. Now with this degree of destruction, because all of this area is necrotic, we're not going to be able to replace this. The cardiac uh, myocytes cannot regenerate. We're going to end up with scarring and fibrosis. So this is that collagen deposition, which is going to impair the contractility of the heart. If it happens to be uh, in a pacemaker uh, area, that can affect uh, conduction leading to arrhythmias. And then the last possibility is that we have chronic infections, persistent injury, or autoimmune and allergic diseases. So we can't clear our acute inflammation. We move on to chronic inflammation. And that, my friends, is the topic of another video. Check that one out. 
So just to finish, uh, here are some questions. Go ahead and pause the video, see if you can answer these, and if not, feel free to watch the video again. As always, thank you for your time. Please follow me on Twitter. Uh, comments down the below are always appreciated. Thank you.